I'm so thrilled to be able to introduce this extraordinary group of panelists who are really going to talk about the impact that women are having on our economy, on our organizations, on our business growth. I mean, to think, and Mohammed earlier spoke about Janet Yellen, and to think between Ye Janet Yellen and Christine Lagarde, the impact that women are having on organizations. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, this wonderful lineup of panelists. We have Liz Hilton, who is the Senior Director at McKinsey and Company, Ann Glover, CMO of ING USA, Kara Segreto, CMO of Prudential Retirement, Denise Carcos, CMO of TD Ameritrade, Ann Ackerley, um, Managing Director, CMO, and Chief Operating Officer of Marketing at BlackRock, and Linda Descano, Managing Director, Head of Social and Content at City. So thank you, and look forward to this very exciting panel. Terrific, thank you. Well, it's such a pleasure to be uh, here with all of you outstanding women leaders, and I think- There are opportunities to work together. <laughs> we'll certainly hope to find those along the way. So we're going we're gonna to cover three topics. We're going to talk a little bit about women in the economy as consumers and financial decision makers. We're going to talk a little bit about marketing, marketing to women. And then we're going to talk about women in the workplace and women, what women bring as leaders. So Anne Ackerley, since we have two Anne's, let's, why, don't we start, why don't we start with you? I know you all have done quite a lot of research on the question of women uh, making financial decisions. Why don't you share a little bit of that with us? Sure. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for sticking it out. Um, women today control the majority of wealth in the United States. Actually, it's just ticked over 50% to 51%. And women are actually going to inherit 70% of the intergenerational wealth transfer. So understanding women and understanding how they approach investing critically important, I think, for all our, our companies. Um, this summer, we did a study. We went out and talked to 17,000 investors globally, men and women. And we analyzed the results a, a whole host of different ways, by country, by type of, um, you know, by asset, class, uh, you know, asset level, but also by male and female. And I'll, I'll focus in, there were actually a lot of differences, but I'll focus in on three specific ones. Um, the first one had to actually do with retirement. While both men and women want comfortable retirements, obviously not surprising, um, women feel a lot less confident in their ability to achieve that result. Um, a very statistical uh, difference there. The second one I'd say is that women felt a lot less confident about making investment decisions. And the third one, which maybe is the most sort of, uh, um, I would say, sort of problematic is that women uh, were far less willing to take on risk and far less willing to invest in the stock market. And if you think about what's happening in the world today, everybody's living longer, but women are living even longer. Um, the average woman will be widowed for 14 years. I think women live something like eight or nine years longer than men on average. Um, women need to actually save more than men and invest more than men. And I think that how they think about risk, we need to help them think about risk differently so that they can be prepared for, for retirement. And Linda, I mean, before we came on stage, we were talking a little bit about the opportunity to shift that pattern. And you had several ideas about how to help women think differently. No, absolutely. When it comes to women and, and confidence, I always think of, well, you know, if I look at other parts of our lives, if you ask most women, are you satisfied with your weight? Most will say, I could stand to lose five or 10 pounds. If you ask women about a job opportunity and say, why don't you apply for this? Most women will say, well, I have eight of the 10 skills, but I don't have those two. Where men, forgive me, if you can spell the job, you're gonna go after it, even if you don't have the skills. So when we ask women about money, I think, I'm not surprised that women are, are saying they're less confident or don't feel they have enough information because we've done very similar research. And when we dig into it, it's really because women are raising the bar high rather than looking about what they achieved. It's what I didn't do. I know I can do more. And I think that's just emblematic of, of other things in our lives. Um, 
and you know, when we also think about the um, how women think about investing, I think what we heard from women is because they're often the chief financial officer, and two thirds of women we surveyed self describe themselves in that role, they're thinking about the long term security of their family. And because that, that preservation and the safety is, is very important, and tend to be sidelined by risk rather than driven by it as men are because they're trying to figure out all the pieces. So there's more we can do as, as advisors and bankers of helping women understand the long-term plan, how the different parts of a financial life come together, and then in that context, the role of risk, the role of inflation, and she can be creating you know, risk that she doesn't anticipate. And I think that can help shift the conversation in a new direction. Yeah. Liz, um, do you mind if I just uh, listen yeah, to please talk go to you? Ahead. you know, um, Linda and Ann, you reminded me of a story. Um, because I work at TD Ameritrade, and we have six million clients. And I'll speak about one, so that's certainly not statistically <laughs> significant. But um, it's emblematic of um, a unique segment that's out there that I found very insightful for us. I was at a trader expo talking to a woman who trades a, a lot for a living. And she was describing to me how she, she thinks she was really strong at trading because she's a woman. And talk about someone who's really not risk averse, the anomaly of what we're describing as what we mostly see and talk about. And she was talking about why she thinks she's a strong trader. And she said, it's because I'm, I, I stick to my strategy. I, I absolutely stick to my strategy. And the reason I do that is because I'm a mother. And she said, I can I have three kids. They're adult now, but if you don't think I could have withstood all of the disappointment and ups and downs <laughs> of being a mother, if I can withstand that, I can deal with the market. And I thought, what an amazing insight. You know, it's like the, the ups and downs of motherhood, of parenthood. It's not even a gender thing. It's just if you can have the wherewithal to take the test of time and, and, and go through those ups and downs, you can probably take the market. And I just thought that was such a alpha way to approach it. And I thought if every woman could have just a, a bit of that confidence, um, we might all be better investors and traders. So sorry to That's a fantastic, <laughs> yeah, that's a great lovely story. story. Well, so Kara, Ann talked at the beginning about the uh, significance of women as financial decision makers. And I know at Prudential, you all have taken a lot of steps to change how you think about marketing to women. And I'd love you to share some of that with the group. Sure. I think uh, you know it's important in, in Prudential Retirement, in the division that I'm the CMO of, uh, what's really critical is we're an institutional business. So we sell through advisors to institutions and then ultimately to consumers. So when we think of our clients, we think of that whole chain in marketing to women. And um, when you think about it, you know the, the opportunity is in the market, and you want to be. A, we've talked about this. We talked about it in the back. You know, you you want to be a reflection of all of your clients as a marketer. That that's that's the right thing to do, and it, it's the way the business grows. And we've started with our advisor group, which is how do you begin to understand that there's an unmet need there? We we've done research, as we all have, that says you know close to 30 percent of women um, want an advisor. They want advice. Um, and 44% of them will say they'll take that advice, right? They're willing to act on it. Um, yet women advisors are, are you know, there's, there's very few in the retirement space. So when you look at that. So we've started programs in marketing to and our training department to build programs that attract women advisors to teach them some of the skills that um, folks here have been speaking about, which is what do you bring to the table that's unique? Um, how are you communicating based on your style that could be advantageous to both institutional decision makers who are more and more becoming women decision makers around those tables that we deal with, and then ultimately the women in the plans that we service. So it, for us, it's how do you build that marketing cycle across all of those constituents? I'll use an example. One of the ones that we've seen in the institutional space, which is something we're looking very heavily at, is in the healthcare space, many decision makers are women around the table. And how, and many of the workers, over 65% of healthcare workers are women. So how do you begin to understand that chain and then build marketing to them through all the channels? So even though it's an institutional business, we think of all of our clients in that way. So we're looking at gender in that way and, as well. And the, and the advice channel plays a really yeah. significant role. Oh, it's, role. for us, we can't get to, we're 99% intermediated in our business. And they're non-captives. 
So our value is to help them build their practices and build business models for the future. And we talk to them about having women financial advisors targeting women is a real way to expand your practice and your business going forward. And to, to build on what, what Kara said, what we found, women were really were not only interested in in hearing from you know our advisors and bankers and experts, but also hearing from other women and hearing stories about how their how other women like them navigated their financial lives. And we created Women in Company as a a publisher of financial lifestyle content to be able to curate you know, um, first person stories of how women were navigating in fire, in, uh, their financial issues. In fact, many of our own employees, myself included, bear our financial soul as a way of, of letting women know that we're dealing with the same issues you are, um, even though we may work in the field, but also to bring in other credible voices because we know women feel they want validation, they want a sounding board, and to give them the ability to hear from others and connect in different ways. And what kinds of topics are you finding that they're more comfortable sharing and what kinds of topics are you finding you know, there's less um, comfort sharing? Women love to share around how to be a savvy spender. So anything that can help get a good deal and show that I'm managing my money. Um, it's the same thing, oh, how do you save money? Also really uh, important. Um, Talking about how to talk to their partner, their parents, their children about money, lots of sharing there, you know, retirement. But when it comes to how much, you know, you're investing, investing strategies, some of who owns, you know, earns what and, and the balance of income and decision making, those conversations often happen offline, at least with our community. Um, but there's, you know, the most that women ask us for is how do I talk? about money it's such an emotionally charged topic and giving them the tools to start those conversations and then manage the reaction whether it's their partner or their their parents That's so yeah I just want to jump in on um, one of the points that you made about the advisor community and how important it is to educate the advisors to deal with women and um, I think it was the other Ann mentioned the statistic about and, and actually the number that we have is the average age of a woman widow in, a, in the US this like frightened me is 56 years old and and so, yeah, we have 59, 50, so it's, it is yeah. frightening. Yeah. So, so imagine this, and I'm sure we all have the numbers from our organizations, is those women have been meeting with their husbands and a financial advisor, those that have financial advisors for many, many years, and the majority of them change financial advisors when their husband dies because the financial advisor never looked them in the eye and never yeah. paid attention to them. And it's it's just, it's such a simple thing. You're meeting with two people, maybe you should like look at the woman. And uh, and you could be rewarded for that in the long term. But but I mean, we're all, we're all learning about this market, but there are some very simple things that we can do. Yes, the lifetime value of the woman is a lot higher than the lifetime value of the man. <laughs> I, I don't know if there's a correlation or not, but it ties to what Ann, you said earlier, and Ann, what you just said is, the other thing that amazes me is most women, I think it's around 70%, self-identify themselves as savers, yeah. not investors. Right. Mm -hmm. What's really interesting is that 70% of men identify themselves as investors, not savers. And I think when you look at some of the things around how you talk about money, right. how you think about money, how you engage with an advisor, advisors looking for an investor, maybe not a saver, I think yeah. some of these things kind of play out in the experiences right. that women, we're creating. Women like to be debt free. Yes. Yeah. And that may not always be the right thing for them, um, whereas men are prepared to have some debt, but put money in the stock market. Yep. So there's all these differences. Yeah. <laughs> we, we see that too with, we all, uh, several of us, our companies sell retirement plans. So think about your company's 401k plan. And we notice that men are much more likely to take a loan against their 401k plan, mm -hmm. whereas women take a hardship withdrawal. And if you take a loan, there are way fewer penalties than if you take if you actually withdraw the money. And it's back to the conservatism. And uh, so there are real education opportunities for the women um, who who are part of our hospital businesses and education businesses to uh, 
to learn how to more effectively sort of manage manage their finances. And, and now I know why my retail marketing programs to women aren't working. <laughs> so thank you for that. There you go. Thank you for those insights. And now I know. So Anne, I know that you have gone through an exciting process to rebrand and that you've thought a lot about the messaging to women in the process of doing that. You want to share a little bit about how that went? Sure, um, or how it is going. Um, <laughs> our company is uh, um, IPO'd last May, May 2nd, so we're almost a, a year uh, into our IPO. So we, I am ING US, so we're the retirement investment and insurance businesses uh, formerly of this big Dutch parent. And so as we have become our own company, one of the things that we have to do is find a new name as a, as a for instance. And, uh, and so over you know, the past uh, uh, quite, a, quite a bit of time, we've been thinking about, well, how are we going to rebrand ING US? And uh, I'm sure there are many of you in the audience that know that our ticker symbol when we became an independent company is VOYA, V-O-Y-A, VOYA Financial. Think about your voyage, your journey to and through retirement. And what we did as we were setting the guidelines and the parameters around how we would select a new name and what kind of a company we wanted to become, it was all about understanding, well, who's our bullseye target audience? And even though we work through advisors and institutions, we said, you know what, we've got to focus on that end consumer. So what do we know about the end consumer? You've heard a lot of the women's st female statistics. And so when it came time to paint sort of that key persona of the bullseye target audience, we said, you know what? It could be Practical Pete, but no, no. It's going to be Practical Patty. We know that 47% of the workforce is female, the 51% wealth number. We have that same number. And so what we, what we envisioned is how do we make sure that our company is going to be seen through the eyes of a woman. And we know that if we can appeal to the woman, that the men are going to come along. And so this is not at all about pink. Our color is orange. We love <laughs> orange. And actually, Voya Financial will be uh, sort of it's we're growing into a new shade of orange. Um, but it all started with that key persona of, uh, of Practical Patty. And we know, you know, she's 46 years old. She has a couple of kids. She has $75,000 in household income. We follow her media day. We know how she thinks about her finances. We pay a whole lot of attention to, uh, to Practical Patty. Well, you know, it's interesting. Ann and I have been talking about, because we went through a major rebranding effort over the last couple of years. We were sharing stories at dinner last night. And I think one of the ways, and it's similar when you look at who you're building toward and who your ultimate client is, you know, I think it's true women are, are in the focus of that because part of what we went through when we went through that journey with the Bring Your Challenge and the Day One program at Prudential was a lot around humanizing mm -hmm. a very difficult topic that is seen as cold and calculating and fear, a lot of fear um, around it. And some of what you're hearing statistically about women, how they buy, how they think, how they collect, really plays into that kind of purpose-driven humanizing way to look at the future and changing that. So it's, it's, it's becoming a dynamic, I think probably right. all of our brands mm -hmm. share a bit. Absolutely. If you ask a woman who manages, or actually if you ask a man, who manages the finances in your household, he says, I do. If you ask a woman who manages the finances in your household, she says, we do. And so Voya Financial is going for the we. There you go. <laughs> That's lovely. That's lovely. Well, Linda, we talked a little bit about uh, what you've done as it relates to women in company and just the role of social and this whole idea of approachability, of making the financial services organizations more approachable and more open. I'd love to hear about how some of the programs that you've been leading have done that. Yeah, you know, we really heard and listened to her about what she valued. And it was all about, you know, give me educational information and content that will help me make smarter decisions and help me put finance in the context of my life. Um, we heard that she wants to connect and um, with other women about their experiences and that she values um, what influencers and bloggers say about product services and, and financial approach. So we knew to be successful with her and we also knew on top of that that she was time pressed and that when it was convenient for her was usually at 10 o'clock at night, maybe over a glass of wine. And um, social 
was really a vehicle for giving her more choice and control over how she could engage and consume our content. We also knew that given that how we're regulated, we might not be able to provide the robust forum for her to have conversations with other women. So what we could do is create content and invite experts from outside of city to share their point of view with us. We could distribute and syndicate that content through all of our regular branded touch points, but we could also go to forums where she naturally was engaging. And you know, with her CEO hat, um, at, for her career, it would be on LinkedIn with her CFO hat for her household. It could be on GoBankingRates.com. It could be on Manila. Um, it could be on different blogger communities. And then with her chief household officer hat around family vacations and travel and entertaining and shopping, it could be on Real Simple, it could be on More Magazine, and that we would make that content available and be part of the conversation and ignite conversation, but always bring her something of value. Because women are spending more of their time online. They're using social to connect, to get educated, and to share. And we want it to be part of her ecosystem, you know, and how we're looking at her media patterns, and, and then use those insights from what she's telling us to then bring insights back to our business, whether it's product driven in innovation, whether it's how we message, whether it's new content we create. And for us, it's been very effective at building trust, um, but also getting other bloggers, influencers, and voices to talk about what we're doing with women. Um, and that has really helped with the credibility and you know, of, of our brand. It's been amazing to see the experimentation that you all have done. Yeah, maybe I would just say one thing, and this is not gender specific, so forgive me, but um, I would say one thing that the financial uh, services industry really has to look at is, uh, we have this great video clip of somebody saying, you know, financial services, it's the least service friendly, um, <laughs> you know, industry in the world. And I think whether you're a man or a woman, generally, um, people do not like to engage with financial services companies. And I think, um, so we're a little bit, I think, as a company, further behind in this male-female thing. But what we have really focused in on is um, the language that we use. And you know, we're investors, and we're alpha and beta, and we're you know, duration, and uh, our favorite one is um, you know, convexity. This is not what people want to hear. And so we have a massive undertaking in the firm to try to put it in language men and women can understand. Yeah, exactly. so it's been less gender specific, but more how do we just get people to engage with us? Because actually, nobody really wants to engage with any of us. Well, yeah. That's, that's true. true. And we've because of the language <laughs> that, that we use. So <laughs> we've actually seen some months, if we look at um, our syndication patterns and traffic, that more men are reading the, the content branded for women than women are. Yeah. So if it's good content, it's it's good and I absolutely it. agree, yeah. if it, you engage women, you will surpass the expectations of men. And so it's a win-win for your brand. Yeah. <laughs> so Denise, you yeah. had the opportunity to work both in financial services, but earlier across a lot of other industries. And I think this whole idea of how much trust is there in financial institutions, which if you look across industries, the trust in financial institutions is really extraordinarily weak. Maybe not quite Less at the level of politicians. I don't know. I think <laughs> so. Right there. But so what would be some of your you know, yeah. sort of advice to this industry or lessons from other, the other industries sure. that you've worked in? Um, sure. I'll, I'll just start by um, giving kind of credit to, to Linda. Linda and I met a couple of years ago when um, Women & Co. launched. And we were trying to get our arms around as a trading company um, that was trying to grow and really espouse the fact that we're more than just trading, we're also about guidance, something that might be more appealing to women. How do I also build something out? And you know, Linda and I connected and she said, well, here's the agency we used for it. Here, she gave me all the assets and was able to empower me and without having a competitive threat, you know, let me kind of run, which I just think is wonderful in terms of the caliber of people on the panel. So I um, want to give you a little shout out. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but in terms of kind of being in financial services and um, having grown up in kind of advertising agencies, spent some time at L.L. Bean, and then you know, today, it's funny, I'm on all these, these financial services panels, but I think of myself as a marketer first. And um, you know, one of the things, I may, not, I may be a politician, I'll answer this directly, so forgive me, <laughs> but one of the things I would say is, um, 
it's such a, because it's such a male dominated industry, it's so much more prevalent as a topic around my leadership table and around my department. So um, oftentimes, the points that we all need to make about how to market to gender, and it's funny, we used to call it a segment, but it's a majority, to Anne's point, it's not a segment. Um, you know, we need to make sure that we're having healthy conversations internally about, about women as leaders. So the one thing I would take from other industries growing up in the advertising agency world, gender never came up from a personal development standpoint as much as it does in financial services. I mentor more people than I ever thought I would um, about women trying to figure out how to be successful in financial services. Um, and that took me a little off guard. Um, I didn't think that it was going to be such a prevalent topic in this day and age. And so I try to not have it be a male versus female conversation ever at my table. It's a leadership conversation. So I think that's really important. If you've got a department of 140 marketers that are showing up every day, you want to make sure they're focused on growing the business. And the way to do that is not to have a male as your foil. Why is he making more than me? It's not about that at all. It's about leadership. And how do you show up to work to move the business forward every day? So I think that's one leadership lesson I've taken um, into this world to try to make sure that that my team is um, is really focused on the right things and not creating um, too much friction in the system. So I may have taken that in a different direction, Liz. I'm yeah, sorry. no, thank you. That's I mean, I know, Anne, that that's something that you've spent quite a lot of time thinking about on behalf of BlackRock is the right. whole topic of women as leaders in the institution and diversifying leadership. Yeah. Um, so I. I, I you know, I think I have a, a pretty strong view around, um, I agree, it's all about leadership and it's all about, you know, being a leader in your company and helping to grow your company. I do think we have to, as an industry, though, stop and say, and, and everybody will always say, well, you know, you've been in the industry for 30 years, is it better? Yeah, absolutely, of course it's better. I'm the most optimistic person ever. Um, but we still have to say, why are there still only, you know, 15% of, uh, you know, managing yeah. directors in financial services are women. And I um, believe it's because we have a narrow view of what a leader is. Mm -hmm. And I think we tend to, when you have people in a company, we define leadership in male attributes. And we like the super confident, the super loud, the super assertive. That's sort of how we have said that's what a successful leader looks like. And I just think we as an industry, we as a as a country need to broaden our view that leaders come in all shapes and sizes and with different um, attributes. And there can be quiet leaders. And there can be leaders who are consensus builders. And um, in financial services, we tend to really want those loud, in-your-face leaders. And we're working really hard to say, there can be lots of different types of leaders, and we need to be open to different, and, and not to stereotype women as consensus builders, and, um, but we tend to be. And I just think we'd all be better served if we had a broader view of what a leader is. I love that point, and, and yeah. I, um, that is a great point. Um, I don't want to take away from you. You had a standing O, I think, over there. So. <laughs> um, but I, I think um, you know. I, I spend a lot of time thinking about your point exactly, and, and how are we here? And I think one of the things I think about having grown up playing sports my whole life, I think it, it helps me in a male-dominated industry because. Um, and I thought about saying this phrase and not saying it the wrong way. I grew up in a locker room, a, a female locker room. Um, and so I, I, I understand team dynamics. I am, I'm very comfortable kind of you know, calling for the ball. Like that's, that's been my DNA since three years old. Um, and I actually, because it's the Olympics and we're sponsors, I looked back and I started to look at when did females actually start teaming? And we are at like a 70-year deficit from men. The women's had, I think, the first team sport in the 1965 era in the Olympics. And men started way back in, in the uh, Greek ages. So we're at a deficit for sure. And I think your point about we have made progress, but we have to accelerate that big time. Um, I get why it's a deficit. Um, and I do think some of this teaming nature it may not come naturally. And it translates into this alpha, wah, wah kind of vocal person. 
Um, and so I think for people who haven't grown up with that experience, don't see it as a deficit, see it as a way to kind of showcase the other things you bring to the table, the softer side, or however you want to articulate that. I think in our company, um, and I, like some of the other panelists, I started off in consumer packaged goods. I worked for many years at, at Pepsi-Cola company, and then coming to the financial services world, there were fewer women, and they didn't really talk to each other. <laughs> and um, yeah. so that, I mean, that was, it was very interesting. And, um, it, and the, the culture that I had grown up in was one where there were women at the top of the organization, there were women at the middle of the organization, and everybody shared their stories. And it really was something wonderful because as a, as a junior marketing person, you heard about like, you know, that, that so-and-so had like a terrible day with her children and somebody's kid was lost and they needed to find the kid. And so you, you had to, you, you really had this whole um, support system almost built in and you couldn't wait for the day that, well, wow, maybe I'll share my terrible story one day when I have one. And you know, sure enough, one day your nanny runs away and you're, <laughs> you're there with like your two little kids trying to figure out what you're gonna do. But it's something that I think, you know, as we're in financial services, it's something that I've tried to bring over is like, you know, share some of those stories because they give hope to the people that are working for you and with you and around you. And because I know I used to look at the, the, the more senior women and think, gosh, if they can do it, I can figure it out. <laughs> and uh, and it, I think it's helped and, and it has made our workplace a little bit more, you know, after I talk to groups of women at our work, they do, they, they do come up to me and they start to share their stories and, you know, one, one, one voice at a time. I think another issue, something we uncovered in the um, State of Professional Women survey that City and LinkedIn do semi-annually is that in general, women don't see themselves staying with one company long enough to really move up and advance. And that's an issue in many big companies we'll have to solve for, because I know we have a good track record where we're getting women coming into the organization, but like many, we're seeing women leave mid-career. And you know, on the, the bright side, women are taking a chance and either changing their career trajectory um, completely or even starting their own business. And I think large companies have to begin to solve for and financial services companies in particular, how are we going to create a work environment that really gives women and men with, you know, who are juggling maybe children, their professional responsibilities, their parents, the ability to bundle and work in different ways. But this is not just an issue for women, it's an, also an issue for millennials. It's all about how are we going to still be an industry where the very best talent wants to come and work. So it's much bigger than just thinking about women. So each of you is already a leader and you've each accomplished a lot. And I just wanted to close with, for, from each of you, maybe some words of advice. So we've talked about the amount of money that's in the control of women as financial decision makers. We've talked about how much change is going on in terms of marketing and the role of social and marketing. We've also talked a little bit about how little, um, it, there's just basically still not enough women in leadership positions in most companies. And so as you think about the landscape, think about a young person who's looking to really make a difference in the industry, what would each of you offer as advice to them about how they can really pave an exciting path? I'll start, and, uh, and I'd say you don't wanna think about the job as sort of a ladder. You wanna take any opportunity that's thrown at you and your career path is going to it's going it's going to be sort of like the social uh, interaction that we see today, right? Where you don't make you go online and then you talk to your friends and then you talk to your parents and then you go back online and um, your career journey is going to be like that. So so please, you know, take be open to the possibility. Yeah, open yeah. The, and yeah, it'll take you maybe, wonderful places. Maybe we'll go in order because I was thinking that where it starts when I sit down and it's something that Denise said. I love being a marketer, so when I sit down and I talk to younger women or men who come and ask for advice about career, I always say, do what you love. Don't think about, I want to do that. Look, there's an extrinsic motivation and intrinsic motivation. We all know it. Um, and I'm not downplaying the importance of extrinsic, <laughs> extrinsic stuff. I would be disingenuous if I sat here and said that. But I think what really makes you feel good about what you do and is authentic and actually gives you the confidence to grow and to lead is to do what you love. You're always learning 
you're passionate about it, and it's amazing to me when you do that, and this is kind of the 80-20 rule, you will gain that confidence and you will take those that winding road, but you'll always contribute. I think it's so important to do what you love to do. Um, me, I'll give um, kind of one and a half stories just real quickly um, to close, but one of the very specific pieces of advice that I would give to um, probably both genders is um, there was there was a meeting I was in one time at a previous job where I was with a bunch of executives, um, all male, and I was presenting this um, PowerPoint that I had worked really hard on. And at the end of it, the gentleman said to me, um, that, was, that was cute. It was cute. <laughs> and then he kept talking and talking. And I was, <laughs> oh my God. I'm Irish, so man, my Irish is going crazy inside. And so I, um, in the moment, I looked around the room and I made a game time decision. I said, Thanks. I think you're cute too, <laughs> and which is great because he's five six. So I was like, awesome. <laughs> and, and so I and and that night I went home and started to do what a lot of people do. It's just kind of my second part of the story. Think about it and think about it and think about it and regret it. When I know that that gentleman's home with his kids, he's running around, he's he's maybe going to the store, fighting with his wife, whatever he's doing, he's not thinking about that. And so I'd say two things. Use your judgment, and in the moment, take care of a situation that you know is going to haunt you all night. And the second thing is to not let it haunt you all yeah, night, right? right? Yeah. I mean, no one's thinking about you at the end of the day. They're pouring a glass of wine. Um, I guess I, I, I'm going to go with, um, you know, volunteer for the hard stuff. So I think one of the best ways, you know, I think about. Um, you know, I've got uh, kids who are just entering, uh, entering the workforce, and, and what advice do I give them? And obviously, I want them to do what they love. But I think the best way sometimes to set yourself apart is to volunteer for the hard thing. So you know, the thing nobody wants to do, well, maybe if you do it, that's a way to, um, to distinguish yourself. And that's sort of the advice I give my kids. And I would say raise a hand and lend a hand. And by raise a hand, I mean, you know, step out of the day to day, the nose to the grindstone, to look around and see what is going on in the industry and in your world so you bring fresh perspectives. If you don't understand something, you don't have to go it alone. Ask for help, ask for an introduction, ask for a connection, and step up to opportunities to volunteer, to raise your profile and build your brand, but also lend a hand, pay it forward, mentor others, men and women, great talent, people who you can see are really the future leaders. You never know when someone is gonna make three steps jump at another company, you could be working for them. Yeah. Build followership for your brand because that will be invaluable when you have to get something done. They're your go-to people that put your projects and your needs above others. Thank you so much. Well, to the audience, on a snowy day, on behalf of the whole panel, we like to yes. say thank, thank you for being here with us. And panelists, I thought it was just fantastic. Thank, thank you, you so much. much.